Jim Rowan, how you going? And welcome back. We are up to June of 2007 in this historical series. Uh, we just saw the end of the Best of Super Juniors that uh, Milano Collection AT took. Uh, that was on the last one. Go back and have a listen if you didn't. But uh, now, uh, there's a little bit left of June to talk about. But I want to go back even further than that. Because, and I believe I teased this at the end of the last podcast, there's a lot of moving parts around this time. And um, I I think I've kind of made mention of it as we went through uh, the other... Uh, sections, the, you know, so far there's been January, February, March to May, um, and then one more, right? And then this one, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I guess I just want to make sure that I've covered this in a complete way and everyone knows what's going on. We'll start back in February. That's when Kurt Angle... Uh, in Ryu Goku in Sumo Hall, teamed up with Nagata and got a win over Giant Bernard and Travis Tomko. And this, of course, was Kurt Angle's New Japan debut. And I mentioned after uh, covering the match that it was reported that Ukes had made the, the call to Team Angle and Nagata up. So they're becoming involved. The new owners, well, I guess not that new. Ukes came in at the end of 2006, I want to say. Um, but, you know, whenever it was, it was quite recent and they're, they're involving themselves. They're hands on type owners. Um, now, so that's in February. By the end of March, Simon Inoki, who was the president at the time, announced that he'd be resigning. And he cited the, these kind of booking decisions as uh, part of his decision, which is kind of strange to me. I mean, not to say that the president wouldn't have a hand in the booking, but that's not really his job. So, um, I mean, look, obviously, he can say whatever he likes, you know, he maybe just wants to save face publicly, uh, or perhaps it's kind of a little angle of his own because, excuse the pun, because he was to then, coincidentally, the same day, uh, join... Antonio Inoki's Inoki Genome Federation that was established. Um, or, well, I guess announced, yeah, established at the time, uh, but it was not until June that they would hold their first show. We'll get to that. Let's go back to Kurt Angle's home promotion. Oh, and by the way, just for the sake of continuity, and the uh, president that replaced Simon was Naoki Shugabayashi, who had been with the company for a long time. So that's the end of the Inoki's, or so one may have thought. Skipping ahead to May, as I said, Kurt Angle, uh, his home promotion is Total Nonstop Action, TNA, and at Sacrifice in May, they had a change of their top prize. They formally used the 12 pounds of gold, the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship title belt. Uh, They, the, the, the associate business agreement between TNA and NWA ended. So a match between Christian Cage, Kurt Angle and Sting, Christian Cage being the, uh, reigning champion, uh, took place at Sacrifice, and Kurt Angle won, but it was a, it was a finish 
wherein uh, Angle had the ankle lock. There was two referees, and both referees called a different finish. The other referee called Sting pinning Christian, whereas the um, referee that, you know, kind of uh, the decision that, that, that carried the decision uh, saw Sting tapping out at the same time to Kurt Angle's ankle lock. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of a kerfuffle about that. It, it moves ahead to TNA Slammiversary in July. Sorry, in June, um, Angle defeated AJ Styles, Chris Harris, Christian Cage, and Samoa Joe in a King of the Mountain match to win what was considered at the time a vacant championship. Just because they, because of that funny finish, they stripped Angle of the championship. But then after this event the vacancy was no longer recognized by TNA. Uh, Angle was just recognized as the the first champion, although they did credit him with two championship wins. So he was a two-time champion across one reign. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah... You might be wondering why I'm including this mess here. Well, just bear with me. (laughs) It will become clearer. Uh, As aforementioned... What the heck was that? We had... um, (laughs) The strange noises in this place are becoming a real feature of this podcast. I don't know how uh, how much they come through. Um, but I can only hope they're as entertaining to you as they are to me. 29th of June, 2007, uh, the aforementioned Enoki Genome Federation first event. It's in Sumo Hall. They drew about 8,500 people, and it was a very classically Enoki-style event that combined pro wrestling and mixed martial arts. It had a, a few primarily mixed martial artists, a few primarily pro wrestlers, but I think Anoki's favorite is just pro wrestlers that can really fight. Um, I'll run down who was on it quickly, just because it's a historic event in, or, I don't know, trivial at least. <laughs> um, Sawa defeated Ishikawa, not Taichi. Sorry, not... Um, yeah, Yuki Ishikawa, by TKO. Rocky Romero defeated El Blazer by referee's decision. Kevin Randleman, uh, MMA uh, legend, might be strong, but very prominent MMA star back in the back in the early two thousands. He defeated Otsuka or Otsuka, I should say. Um, O'Hara defeated. Kuno, uh, Kiyoshi Tamura of UWFI uh, fame. And is it... Oh, wait. No, wait. Is Kiyoshi Tamura Pancrase? I watched all that stuff at the same time, so... Um, sometimes I have a trouble remembering exactly where they came from. Um, Tamura... He might have been both, you know. Yeah, he was UWF. He went to rings, and then he went to Pride. I was right the first time. Okay. Uh, Tamora and Yuiyama defeated Matsuda and Kotake. I'm sorry if a lot of these names are uh, strange to pretty much everyone listening. I only rec- I mean, I am into this stuff and I only recognize a few of these. Josh Barnett is a more recognizable name. He beat Tadao Yasuda, who you might recall uh, from the, let's see, first podcast I would have done on, in this series, the uh, Enochism era. He beat Yuji Nagata in a tournament to, he was a, he's a former IWGP heavyweight champion. Uh, Nagata ended up beating him to take his first 
championship uh, title or, or his first uh, uh, IWGP heavyweight title anyway. But um, in this case, uh, it's Josh Barnett that beats Yasuda. Then in the um, co-main, semi-main, Naoya, Naoya Ogawa defeated Mark Coleman by referee decision. Uh, Ogawa, of course, the famous rivalry with Shinsuke Nakamura, Mark Coleman, um, the... I, I, I went over him. Actually, I don't know if I ever made the correction. I didn't double-check my work well enough when I was talking about the title... This would have been in both the title, the history of the heavyweight title belt podcast that I did, and it also would have been in that um, the, the one I just talked about, the Anarchism for podcast. I didn't double-check my work. I read in The Observer that Mark Coleman was the Pride heavyweight champion. And even though I would have been looking at the card and, and all sorts of stuff. And I actually remember, vaguely remember being confused a bit by it, but that should have triggered me researching it more. And I I promise usually that is the case. For whatever reason, this kind of slipped by. I, I guess there's a lot of data and information that I'm going through. So this one slipped by, and this is the kind of thing that I'm happy for people to call me up on, by the way, because uh, as you're seeing right now, or hearing right now, I will call myself out on it when I realize Mark Homan was not Pride Heavyweight Champion when Inoki gave him the WWF Martial Arts title. I still think the idea was for a super fight. I mean, that seems pretty clear to me. Um, and I think maybe, because it was a bit confusing that they still did... Um, MMA fights after that, maybe the hope was that Mark Coleman would beat, um, I guess Fedor probably was champion at that time. He was champion most of the time. Let's see. Pride Heavyweight Championship. He won it in 2003, and he had it till, I mean, he never lost, so he just had it since then, until it was absorbed by the UFC, I suppose. So, um... Yeah, he would have had to have beat Fedor. So that that was quite hopeful. Mark Coleman wasn't at his prime at that time. Um, so maybe that maybe they even weren't that hopeful. But sorry, I've digressed. Just mentioning that there was an error in that uh, the, he was not the champion at the time. But he was certainly, because I, I watched it. That's on Fight Pass, the UFC's... Um, streaming service. I watched that fight. I watched Inoki put the WWF martial arts title around his waist. So everything else was correct. It was just that um, he wasn't actually pride champion. Um, and I won't blame Meltzer, but perhaps he should amend his newsletter. Or well, actually, I don't know. Would you? Maybe that's cheating. Maybe going back and amending things. No, that actually would be cheating, right? Because he's reporting on news as it happens. If you were to go back in hindsight and just change everything so he's right, that would be that would be wrong. So, no. Fair play. Anyway, all of this is to get to what would, what what actually connects us to what I was talking about at the beginning of this podcast, the main event of the first IGF event is for the IWGP third belt title, which Kurt Angle has held I should have gone back a little further, I suppose. Oh, sorry. No. Here's me getting my timelines mixed up again. Brock Lesnar is a third belt champion. Now, this we should be well aware of. Um, covered it in the second podcast of this series. Brock Lesnar was stripped of the IWGP heavyweight title, the third generation title belt, because he didn't want to be paid less, or some other reason, whatever. Who knows? It's difficult for us to know the real reasons behind these things. That's the reason that made the most sense to me. But the fact is, he sucked as champion and probably knew it and um, knew that they wanted to get rid of him. So, um, Or at least not pay him so much to suck so bad. Uh, 
so the other rumors such as you know one of them is that he just didn't want to lose to Tanahashi he didn't think Tanahashi was worth losing to I mean if you watch those matches I don't know if Brock really cares enough to care who he wins or loses to I think he's at this time really just doing whatever it is that's going to pay him the most money because he clearly wasn't too interested in having good matches. That, fortunately, was not the case here against Kurt Angle. So I don't know exactly how they organized this. I don't know how involved Anoki still is with New Japan. Maybe he's just doing them a favor here. But he's brought Brock Lesnar back so that he will defend this title that he that he kind of just stole. Of course, he when the negotiations went south, Brock Lesnar went back home with the title belt physically within his possession. So uh, that's when New Japan Pro Wrestling needed to revive the second generation title belt. And that's what Hiroshi Tanahashi has been wearing around, the crown-shaped title. So... The main event of the Sumo Hall show of uh, IGF, Kurt Angle is to challenge Brock Lesnar for this title belt, which is now being referred to as the third title belt. And I found this on a... (laughs) I mean, I almost think it... I found it on Daily Motion. It's on Daily Motion. I'll link it below if it's still available. And... I would recommend this match. It's a good one. I'll go through it. But um, it's just funny that I I nearly paused like I shouldn't... I shouldn't advertise Daily Motion because it's not a real website like YouTube. No. If it's one of those, like... Sometimes I find these on, like, Russian websites or Chinese websites, and that's a little dodgier because... I don't know. I guess... It's just a little bit more unknown about it. But um, Daily Motion's fine. You can go watch Daily Motion. It just has the same annoying queued up videos after you watch anything about Michael Jordan. Um, Because he's still relevant. That series was ages ago now. Come on. Get with it, Daily Motion. I don't know if everyone gets the same recommendations. Anyway, this match was good. Um, so I've gone through the history of it, and uh, of course, as well, Bro- uh, Angle is the TNA heavyweight champion, but that title's not on the line here, and he doesn't even bring it out to the ring. So Angle goes straight for Lesnar at the beginning of this match, pretty aggressively. It's uh, it's intense, it's physical, as anyone would. Uh, well, expect and would have hoped for in Lesnar's New Japan run, but not often the case, unfortunately. Lesnar takes over the match. He's in no rush. Um, he, he wants to slow the match down, but that creates excitement when Angle attempts these comebacks with speed. The match leaves the ring a couple of times, but they are quick to return. It, it mostly just happens in the ring. Um, and, and, I mean, that's a part of the appealing to me very sports-like feel to it um and of course we, we haven't really described how the event has been presented it's a white mat it's got the red and blue corners it's a very clean look this igf show um and yes uh, a nice canvas for these two to create their violent art on so um lesnar's offense is suplex heavy But he does vary the moves, for those that are instantly turned off by that statement. There's a a headlock that Angle powers out of with a back body drop, but Lesnar just stays on top of him. There's a powerbomb that's countered like a sunset flip, but into the ankle hold, which the crowd very much enjoy. And Lesnar kicks Angle off, but it did some damage. He's limping now. And it makes him easier to take off his feet. So Angle lands a couple of German suplexes, but Lesnar dodges the Olympic slam. He goes for the verdict, the Japanese name for the F5, but Angle counters into a DDT. Then his 
Shoulder straps come down and Angle re-secures the ankle. But again, Brock fights him off. Just too strong. He tosses him through the air with a suplex. Then Lesnar misses a corner attack. This time he goes over with the Olympic slam, or the angle slam, but he kicks out of the pinfall. The ankle lock goes back on. Once again, it is countered. Uh, this time into a surprisingly neat and agile pin from Lesnar. He hits the verdict. Then after that, he, he does hit the verdict, but only the two counts, so they both hit their finish. Both got two counts. So now Lesnar, having hit his best move, decides to go for the ankle lock. But that's a mistake with Angle knowing not just the way out, but his own way straight into the hold, which finally forces Lesnar to quit, resulting, uh, well, a, a result that the fans clearly appreciate. Um, so the title changes hands. Uh, Angle actually, maybe he did wear the TNA title to the ring because after the match I noted that he is handled. He's handed the TNA title belt, but for some reason not the IWGP title belt. Um, and he really, he just he leaves the ring pretty quickly without really seeming to expect receiving it. So that's kind of odd. But he did win it, and that belt is finally once again in the hands of a defending champion. Um, and I I've t- talked about this match before. I think it was in the title history podcast which isn't strictly a part of this series. I just, I don't know how accurate this is. I just described it as an American-style match. It only went 10 minutes, by the way. American-style match with a Japanese spirit. It was kind of, I would also perhaps describe it as not a Suplex City match from Brock Lesnar's championship run in WWE, but a similar certainly a similar physicality to it, just a bit more varied. You might even argue that Angle, being as technical as he is, Brock Lesnar wouldn't have gotten away with just doing German suplex after German suplex, if we are to keep that kayfabe, um, that he needed to mix it up in order to keep Angle guessing and actually secure those holds and uh, make those throws happen. So, um, but... Look, in any case, I'll put the link below. I would suggest checking it out. Not only is it um, an important match in New Japan's history that didn't even take place in New Japan, but it's a good match. It's worth a watch. Before we wrap up June, uh, I've, I, I kind of just wanted to put all that stuff together, but there was a an Apache Pro match in Korokuen Hall where the WEW heavyweight title of Togi Makabe's was on the line, and Kintaro Kanemura, or Kanemura defeated him for it. Kanemura, the new WEW heavyweight champion, and Togi Makabe now without a title belt. But if you recall, back in May, on the last podcast we covered it, he pinned... Nagata in an elimination match and earned himself a shot at the IWGP heavyweight title. So perhaps his focus was on that and not enough on this title defense because he lost the title. And that brings us to July. The 1st of July, we had a lockup show in Osaka. So um, I've covered this before. The the lockup shows are the... Um, joint shows with Ricky Pro, and on this one, we had Yamamoto and Choshu defeating Koshinaka and Yano of GBH, that's a pretty big win for those two, the youngster and the uh, veteran going over, I mean, a couple of pretty significant guys within GBH, mid-carders maybe, but still, Apache Army, which is... Kentaro, Kintaro Kanemura, and Mama Sasaki defeated, uh, again, Great Bash Heel. This was uh, Togi Makabe, Honma, and Ishii. So, GBH not having a good night. But um, Yano defeated Daisuke Sakamoto, and Gentaro and Inoue, and Kanemura, 
and Wada and Sasaki and Hirasawa and Yamamoto and Koshinaka and Yuano and Naito and Makabe and Honma and Ishii and Yano and Yujiro and Obata in what I have to guess was like an over-the-top battle royal or something. And I don't know why I wrote it out that way. <laughs> uh jeez. Also on the 1st of July, Dragon Gate held a show. You might be wondering, why are we talking about all these promotions that are not New Japan? I thought this was a New Japan podcast. Well, New Japan's really branching out. And in Kobe, the war international junior heavyweight tag team title was defended, uh, of course, CTU's Gato and Jado of New Japan are the champions. So that's why I bring it up. But they were defeated. Typhoon, Ryo Saito, and Susumu Yokosua. Yok- Yokosuka. Whoa, Susumu. That's a cool name. Let's just call him that. They took the titles. So I... I uh, believe this is the end of the run for these titles in New Japan. No longer do we have them de- being defended singularly or alongside the IWGP Junior Heavyweight titles. Um, and actually, in Dragon Gate even, they were to become inactive before the end of 2007, though they were resuscitated in 2010. So, uh, that little... Adventure is over in the junior tag division. It did remind me, though, of, unfortunately, another correction I might have to make. Um, it would have been in the January podcast. I just, it's only a small one. I was talking about war and how Tenru started it, and I was trying to remember who it was, and I was like, I just listened to this recently, and I was like, Wait, he didn't go from New Japan to All Japan. He was an All Japan guy. He went from All Japan to this war thing and back to All Japan. I just, I mentioned New Japan. It's a really small thing. I think I, I was thinking of Choshu, I think, and got a bit mixed up while I was trying to remember who I'm thinking of, because of course they're of the same generation. But um, anyway, a very small correction. But yes, of course it is uh, Tenru that uh, began war. This is different now though I think at this point Tenru's back with all Japan and, and wars are well it's actually not it's it's defunct it's not even around anymore it's just the titles that remain um, it's kind of like the WEW title in that yeah Japan is happy to kind of keep those titles named the same uh, with the with the same initials even if those companies are gone so it's kind of just another example of that But let's move ahead to the actual New Japan stuff actually taking place in New Japan. So we're in Korokuen Hall for the 6th of January, sorry, January, 6th of July. And we uh, had Jado's first match back since the injury that kept him out of the Best of Super Juniors tournament. And uh, saw Gato embarrassingly lose to Jado's replacement, Tetsuya Naito. The young Naito. So Jado's back with... um, Oh, I didn't even make note of his match. He was probably just on the undercard. Nothing match. Uh, A most significant match in their division, though, was for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team titles that Jado and Gato recently lost to Dick Togo and Taka Minchinoku. They successfully defended those titles against Koji Kanemoto and Wataru Inoue. Pretty big win for Togo and Taka there. Kanemoto and Inoue, um, a, well, certainly in their, their own rights in, in singles competition, very, very much top juniors. Uh, the other junior title was defended, the singles IWGP junior heavyweight title. Taguchi defeated Minoru. Taguchi wins. Taguchi's the new champion. He ends Minoru's uh, fourth reign as champion. And I didn't make a note of if this was Taguchi's first title reign. I want to say it is. Okay, so Taguchi went into the Super Juniors and he was during the Super Juniors that he defeated 
um, Minoru. So that was the reason for this championship match. And yes, this is not only his first IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship win. It's his first singles championship win. So there you go. Great stuff for the funky weapon. Congratulations to Gucci. Then in the main event on this show, in Korokuen Hall, we have a match on New Japan World. So that'll be a link below. The IWGP heavyweight title was on the line. Yuji Nagata, of course, the champion, defending against Togi Makabe. Just mentioned before that he had this match coming up. He's just lost the WEW title. And it's now time for him to, to go for the biggest prize of all. Um, he's really coming into his own, though, despite having lost that title, which is a bit of a hardcore title, and that's definitely Makabe's... Um, wheelhouse is that brawling and weapons and cheating and he's a menace he's a menace for sure but he's really good at it and he's he's um really really shined um this year I mean I hate that stuff don't get me wrong but he's you know he's a key player for GBH Tenzan's there but he's and you know Tenzan's leader but you know, like when he was away in all Japan for a while, teaming with Kojima, Makabe was the de facto leader, um, and he just kind of often still seems like the leader of this this faction. So um, he's, he certainly seems to be ranked higher than Tenzan, and. Part of that is the support he has from his team, of course, who unfortunately do join him for this match. Makabe carries himself really nonchalantly before this match. He's kind of got a disrespectful smugness, smugness about him, but he springs to life when he sees an opportunity to gouge at Nagata's eyes. And when the champion fights back, Makabe leaves the ring, grabs a chair. He decides not to use it. Instead, he decides to bring the fight outside of the ring. And the camera has trouble properly, fo properly following them. Um, I, I noted here there was a... <laughs> the, the, they, they're going into, towards the crowd and Taichi is there with uh, some you know, officials' duties. And he's really just going through the motions of protecting the crowd, doing the bare minimum. Meanwhile, Makabe is breaking a chair over Nagata's head. And then Honma hands Makabe a pair of scissors, but Nagata catches them before they strike his head. Makabe pushes him to the floor, though, and then he drives the blades down into Nagata's forehead and pierces the skin. Makabe then targets the wound, and soon blood is covering Nagata's face, which is made even worse when the GBH members at ringside join in the attack. So before he can rejoin the match um, properly, like in the ring, Makabe punches Nagata in the head with his chain-wrapped fist while the referee just is completely clueless. As uh, I, you know, I have no idea how he misses all this. Um, he's looking at everything except what's going on in the match. But finally, Makabe does suplex Nagata into the ring and... Uno is red shoes is uh you know just so uh, you know, uh, unknowing about any of this that he counts the pin. But Nagata kicks out. Uh, having said that, the assault is far from over. Makabe chokes him between the ropes with the chain. Iska's finally seen enough, and he runs down and stands up for Nagata, where the com incompetent referee can't. Uh, Yano takes him out of the ring, though the uh, protection from the outside, from GBH, and Makabe physically threatens the referee as Nagata continues to survive, but the match goes on. Like Again, the referee's got no problem with this, it seems. He's taken a beating, Nagata, but he beckons on more. He's unwilling to submit to the underhanded bully attempts to steal his title. Makabe runs at Nagata in the corner, but is dodged, and 
a flurry of elbows come raining down back the other way, and it bursts Makabe wide open. He gets a strike to the head and is showing color hard way. Suddenly the playing field looks a little more even, and it is a bloodbath. Nagata's relentless with his knees and his kicks in this comeback. The referee has the nerve to check on Makabe at some point, and Nagata rightfully pushes him aside to continue his attack. An exploder lands, and then an arm breaker. Makabe tries to counter, but Nagata takes him down and locks in the armbar. Makabe's bleeding profu- profusely and somehow makes it to the ropes, still. Ishii and Homa try to get in the ring, but they're quickly dealt with by Nagata. A brain bester connects, but it doesn't end proceedings, and Makabe uses the referee to squirm out of the back suplex. Nagata's face was really bad before, but Makabe, at this point, it's kind of dried up on his face. Makabe's just got the full crimson mask at this point. It's even bleeding into his eyes and making them red. He lands a Death Valley driver and then a bridging German suplex, but Nagata endures. GBS try to distract Uno again, but this time they're not successful. And when Makabe hits Nagata with a lariat that is assisted by the chain, the referee refuses to count the pin. So he doesn't disqualify the challenger in the title match, but he's just, well, I'm not going to let you pin him. Okay, right now anyway. As if that damage just is soaked back up as soon as Nagata returns to his feet. Anyway, Makabe nails Nagata with a pile driver onto a chair that has entered the ring. Uh, this is once again in full view of Red Shoes, and he berates Makabe for his behavior, but you can hardly blame Makabe for it when it's so easy to get away with. He's doing it right in front of the referee. He's still, obviously, not been disqualified. Um, he does, Uno is now trying to push back on Makabe though, and it does give Nagata a chance to, naco- to recover, if nothing else. Um, that allows him to dodge a King Kong knee drop, and then he comes back with more kicks. He refuses to give in to the overwhelming damage that he's already sustained. He heaves Makabe over with a back suplex, but unbelievably, the challenger kicks out of the pin at one. So they both return to their feet. They're striking each other with slaps. Nagata lands a stiff head kick that drops Makabe flat on his back. There's another back suplex that lands, and it's almost a power slam-like in the technique, but it allows for a quick pin, and it earns Nagata the win. He defends his title successfully. He's quickly attended to by the ringside officials who tie a towel around his head. Makabe refuses the same treatment. Uh, wants to leave the ring under his own power, still bleeding profusely. Although part of the reason that they tie the towel around the head of the um, when they're bleeding is so that you know in the in the highlights clips or whatnot you can kind of make it a little more child friendly. The blood is is a bit too violent, so Makabe's like, no, I don't care about the kids. I'm going to bleed in front of all of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Nagata stands tall in the ring, having survived an extreme battle, emerging the rightful champion. He humbly answers questions posed to him in a post-match interview that I do not understand, but the crowd make it clear that they have his back. Now, um, I only really rate the matches on World properly, and if you don't recall my rating system... Could be terrible, bad, disappointing, fine, good, very good, great or special. This one I call very good. And I would say, go ahead, click the link below, go watch it. Because um, despite the fact that the referees presented as an absolute idiot, and despite the fact that GBH get involved without any repercussion, um, it... And, you know, all the weapons and all of this stuff, it's still made for a really dramatic match. And Nagata's a great baby face to be coming back from that. Um, and, you know, like psychologically, the match did escalate naturally and into a satisfying finish. It was treated as a fight. Um... These 
when when these matches come along every now and then and they fit the scenario they can be really good and that's what I deemed this I deemed this the time to do it and I I enjoyed it um, if it happened all the time I would hate it but um, you know this this is Makabe's gimmick he he I'm not loving it as a style but he does it well and this match really kind of put him I don't know I think it raised him a little bit so um, oh gee you know what we're close to the end of this how much more can we get in I think we can make it up to a certain tournament of considerable note but uh on the 8th of the 7th, I think that's, where were we? Seven, 6th of the 7th was the last one, so two days later, the New Japan CTU Farewell Tour. Now, where did I make a note of this? I think I talk about it on the actual final show here, the CTU uh, farewell tour basically um, I'll see if I can find it just so I don't skip details although I suppose I'll probably go over it properly when I get to it uh, basically Liger decided that CTU had run its course um, they had successfully taken over the junior division as they set out to do and uh, he wanted to go out on top so he kind of just announced it, that it was going to be dissolved and thus the CTU farewell tour. On the 8th, the first show of this tour, there was a tag team title defense. Giant Bernard and Travis Tomkov are the champions and they defeated the New Japan Dragons, which is Hiroshi Tanahashi and Naofumi Yamamoto. I think they tagged together in the National Tag League, but I'm not sure. National Tag League being the, the, the tournament when they, the tag partners need to be from the same region of Japan. But in any case, John Bernard and Travis Tomko retain. The next night, um, also in Gifu, Samurai Jim. Taguchi and Yujiro defeated CTU's Minoru and Prince Devitt. That's a big win for those two, Taguchi and Yujiro. Uh, Prince Prince is that team, Minoru and, and Prince Devitt, they're Prince Prince. Um, and then it wasn't a title defense by the looks, but Bernard and Tomko defeated Yamamoto again, this time partnering with Izka. Orlando Jordan, is this his? I swear I... I swear I, I just write notes and I don't know where they go. Was this Jordan's debut? Not that it's a significant one, really, but still. Where do I put these notes? Anyway, so Orlando Jordan's here. That's the first. Maybe maybe I did already talk about it. I probably did. That's the other thing. And I, I don't know if I've said this every podcast. It can be hard to keep up with the timeline in my own head because I'm going back and forth between all these different timelines. So, sometimes I get a bit confused. My apologies. Hopefully, the continuity is good enough that you can follow. Uh, that's what I found when I was listening back to some of these, is that instantly I go, no idiot, you already talked about that. So, it's, it's a bit easier when you're following it in order, but, you know, I have to kind of do these going back and forth. So, um, again, my apologies. Anyway, so... Where were we up to? The ninth? Yes. Orlando Jordan and Shinsuke Nakamura of New Japan Black defeated Choshu and Uwano. GBH's Makabe and Honma defeated Chono and Milana Collection of Black. Tanahashi, Nakanishi, and Nagata defeated Tenzan, Koshinaka, and Yano of Great Bash Heel. That was on the ninth. Decent card there. Then on the tenth... Um, the New Japan Dragons are back together, but once again, 
saw defeat, this time at the hands of Izga and Nagata. On the 12th, they moved to Sendai, and there was a G1 Climax participation, or a pair of these matches, so it's a qualification match is another way to put it. Toru Yano defeated Takashi Izuka, so we will see Toru Yano in the G1. And Shira Koshinaka defeated Ricky Choshu. So a couple of GBH guys entering that upcoming tournament. Hiroshi Tanahashi defeated Orlando Jordan the next night in Sendai on the 13th in a singles match. No surprises there. Then on the 15th, just to divert away from New Japan once again for a moment, Victory Road. TNA pay-per-view took place. Kurt Angle, the TNA world champion and IWGP third belt champion, teamed up with Samoa Joe, the X Division champion, and they defeated Team 3D, Brother Ray, Brother Devon, the TNA tag team champions, in a tag team match, of course, but for all of those titles except the third title belt. So it was for... Angle's TNA title, sorry, Angle's TNA World title for Samoa Joe's TNA X Division title and for the Dudley's uh, TNA uh, tag team titles. I don't know how they would have worked out. Like, does Devon get the X Division and Brother Ray or Bubba Ray get the world? Did they? I guess they must have figured that out beforehand. Or... They knew they were going to lose, so they didn't bother even trying to explain it. I don't know. They could have. They could have explained it. I didn't um, watch any of the build to this, or even this match. Uh, I just know that Angle and Samoa Joe won, so they retain their titles, and they're now also the tag team champions. Um, but what this led to was, because as I said, the third belt was not on the line for this. Uh, on that occasion, but this match led to Joe, Samoa Joe, challenging Kurt Angle to a winner-take-all match at Hard Justice, and that um, that match was to include the IWGP third belt. Um, okay, let's just finish off July here, so uh, we had a lock-up show. Um, Koshinaka, Ishii, and Yano defeated Choshu, Izuka, and Yuano, which is a pretty routine main event. Uh, probably more interesting, actually, was a match, at least in hindsight, uh, I know a more interesting match on the undercard. Mochizuki and Kanda defeat New Hazard, which is Jack Evans, and Shingo Takagi. This is Shingo's New Japan debut. But he wouldn't return to the promotion until he was revealed as the newest member of Los Ingobernables de Japón in 2018. Spoiler alert if you were hoping to follow me from this point, 2007, all the way through to 2018. Hopefully you forget by then, because it's the last time I'll mention Shingo Takagi until then. Cool little note though, Jack Evans as well. I think he's with uh, AEW now. I don't, I'm not as familiar with him. And we're running out of time, so we're not going to look it up. 29th of July, uh, oh, we did back-to-back lock-up shows. So that was was on the 20th, and then on the 29th, there was a best two out of three falls match, and it was uh, GBH's Gato, Tenzan, Jado, Makabe defeating the Apache Army. So that is still going on. Gentaro, Mammoth Sasaki. Kuroda and Togo. So that one went um, Jado defeating Gentaro, Kuroda defeating Jado, or, you know, eliminating Makabe, eliminating Sasaki, and then Ricky Choshu defeated. Oh, no, that was the end of that one. And then there was also, as a separate match, Ricky Choshu defeating Ishii. And then uh, Nakanishi defeating Sekimoto. But um, for the WEW heavyweight title, of course, Kanemura just not too long ago won it off of Makabe. Now Makabe's buddy Toru Yano has his shot, and he wins. Toru Yano is the the new WEW heavyweight champion. So um, 
GBH take the title back. But um, that'll do it for this one, I think. So next is August. That's the end of July. The next podcast will start in August. And it will start with the G1 Climax 2007. Uh, So I hope you're looking forward to that. It will be released soon after this one, I'm sure. Thank you very much for listening. And until then, have a good one.